Well, let me first uh, congratulate the organizers for making this uh, conference very multidisciplinary and very multisectoral. Um, for a medical doctor like myself, it's very refreshing to see that uh, life actually do not revolve around the doctors. Um, I'll be sharing with you about um, a completely different problem, and that is in relation to type 2 diabetes. In a very small island uh, state called Singapore, we have been trying to increase our um, uh, physical size uh, over the years, and uh, Singapore is becoming more and more rectangular, you know, especially in its southern borders. Um, in terms of the population size, it has grown dramatically, not because of reproduction, but because of immigration. So the size of the population have increased. Um, the majority of it is actually the non-resident population. And as you all know, the ethnic composition, predominantly Chinese, but we have also a substantial Malay and Indian population. And in recent years, um, the others group has gone up to about 3.3%. So like I said, the increase in Singapore population is not due to fertility. In fact, our fertility rate plunged. Within a decade, our fertility rate dropped from about uh, 5,000 down to almost one, less than 1.5. To give you a personal example, my mom has 10 kids. I'm number 10. I have one kid. Right? So the rate of change in Singapore is everything just happens fast, okay? even in, in this area of drop in the fertility. This was Singapore River when I was growing up in the late 50s, early 60s. I still remember going there as a kid, enjoying my favorite uh, bowl of noodles. Extremely tasty, but the river was extremely foul smelling, extremely polluted. And this is Singapore River today. You still have nice food, not as nice as my noodles in the past. Things are very clean. There's even fish and aquatic life in the, in the river. And again, things change very rapidly. Public housing. When I was a medical student in the 70s, this is where I stayed. The same location is now full of high-rise flats. And the most impressive um, uh, public housing is now called the Pinnacle, where the high-rise blocks of 50 over stories are linked with gardens in the sky. But when it comes to disease um, burden, the chronic diseases are, are right on top, and especially if you look in terms of the burden of diseases, the top ones are diabetes, ischemic heart disease, and stroke. And ischemic heart disease and stroke are actually complications of uh, type 2 diabetes. So in terms of the problem with um, a health problem in terms of chronic diseases, the main burden actually arises from type 2 diabetes. We saw the rate of type 2 diabetes rising even in the 1970s. Alerted the government and prevention strategies were put in place. We have national health surveys once every six years and we thought that it was plateauing off or even might be declining until the latest um, survey in 2010, what we saw was that it's now 11.3, 11.3 out of 100. When I first started in my academic career, I worked on breast cancer. Female breast cancer is the most common cancer in Singapore. And we're talking about 60 per 100,000. Now we're talking about 10 per 100. It's totally different scale. Well, obesity is the biggest risk factor in terms of type 2 diabetes. If you come to Singapore, you hardly see anyone who is obese, right? If you use BMI of cutoff point of uh, 30 kg per meter square, the change in BMI wasn't that dramatic, especially among the Chinese, perhaps a bit more dramatic in the Malay and Indian population. But among the Chinese population, the change in BMI is not that dramatic. This chart is basically trying to tell you that BMI is not a good indicator for obesity in Asians. Obesity measured in a Caucasian population 
as defined by 30, uh, BMI of 30 is different for Asians. In Asians, the BMI cutoff point should be 27. If you, in other words, if you compare an Asian of BMI of 27 and a Caucasian of BMI of 30, the percentage body fat is the same. And in terms of the risk for obesity-related re conditions, they are also the same. In other words, we need a lower cutoff point for Asians. So if we look at this and convert it to 27.5, the obesity rates in Singapore is rising. Right? So Asians are obese, but just like in all things Asian, we hide it very well. Right? <laughs> So it's the intra-abdominal fat that we are hiding. You don't see us as obese. I have a frame of about 1.75, 1.8 meters, and I'm at the borderline of being called obese based on this newer set of BMI. Now, what have we gone wrong? Why has why the, 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 the rate of obesity gone up and diabetes gone up? We have a lot of uh, programs. So we have physical activity kind of programs at the community centers, at community clubs. The Health Promotion Board has come up with uh, healthy living, healthy uh, eating, and healthier choice in terms of various food items. We put all our 18-year-old men in military service, right? Two years of compulsory military service, and even after that, every year you come, you are back for reservist training and you are back for uh, physical activity, all the way until you are 55. Right? So we should have a very fit and healthy population. But every weekend, this national servicemen who go on out of their camp are confronted with uh, a whole variety of uh, various kinds of food items. The national pastime in Singapore is eating. Right? And um, the increase in terms of uh, westernized lifestyle and even with sodas, for example, a can of Coca-Cola contains nine teaspoonful of sugar. So imagine drinking nine teaspoonful of sugar every single can of Coke that you're drinking, right? Same thing with ice lemon tea, is about seven teaspoonful and so forth. And when it comes to the issue of transport, most Singaporeans do not walk. We love to drive, right? Part of the reason we give is because of the fact that it's, high, it's very humid, when the, my university president calls me for a meeting, I have to walk 500 meters. I don't walk, I drive. The reason is because if I don't drive, um, I'll be drenched and perspiring when I meet my university president, or I may be caught after the meeting, it may be a heavy downpour, and I can't get away from his office. And the mass rapid transport system, as well as the public transport, the, one of the objective is to cut down the amount of time or the di distance that is needed for walking. So one of the goal was less than 500 meters um, that a commuter needs to, to walk between stations. So my final slide here, I just want to cover the point on urbanization and obesity. Although it's unfair to have this equation, but the perception is that an urbanized lifestyle is basically a very obesogenic environment. The ease of transport, apartment type of living, office environment, there's a decline in the level of physical activity. And there's a conflict in terms of health messages versus the ease and easy availability of unhealthy food items. The second point is, I think there's a lot of a lack of awareness. There's a superficial level of knowledge in terms of uh, what are the causes of obesity and the causes of type 2 diabetes. Last weekend, we just, I just conducted a breakfast for some CEOs, and we're sharing with them about the problem of type 2 diabetes that employers need to own the problem. That as you have um, increasing um, uh, age of retirement, the, working pop the proportion of people with type 2 diabetes is going to increase in, among the working population. Most of the CEOs were rather shocked that they are going to be faced with workers suffering from type 2 diabetes and the cost of looking after them. Secondly, though I'm a molecular epidemiologist, I've been doing quite a lot of uh, genomic studies, 
the genomic studies have distracted us. Essentially, we were hoping that the genomic era could, find, could identify for us genetic risk for common diseases. The sad truth is you cannot blame your genes. You cannot blame your genes when it comes to type 2 diabetes. You cannot blame your genes when it comes to obesity. Even if you are genetically predisposed to um, obesity, like for example, the FTO gene, you could reverse it with sufficient physical activity. And finally, there's a lack of coordination. The need for multi-sectoral, multi-agencies, and a whole of government approach. In other words, the control of obesity, the control of diabetes should not be just the problem of the Ministry of Health. In fact, most ministries of health are not ministries of health. They are ministries of diseases because they are interested more in terms of health care. Right? In other words, primary health care, secondary health care, tertiary health care. They should be called ministry of diseases. If you are ministry of health, you should be focusing on primary health care. So the need to have a multi-sectoral approach in terms of um, uh, a multi-ministry approach and whole of government approach in terms of, of uh, control and prevention of chronic diseases. And finally, that because of the rate of change, as well as the increased expectation of the community and the population, and the pressure for governments to have what we call evidence-based policy making, perhaps we need to have a new way of thinking of how do we create the evidence. The traditional medical approach is we conduct a trial. We conduct a community trial. If I want to see if, if I'm going to see the effects of, um, of lifestyle changes on the, um, um, the rates of diabetes, I will need a trial that takes 30, 40, 50 years. The ministers would have changed five or six times, and in some countries, 50 or 60 times. So the, the, perhaps we need to have some form of uh, integrative modeling and simulation to come up with evidence. In other words, it, it's a form of collecting what, whatever data is out there that's available and integrate them and run simulations. And perhaps that's a way of uh, being able to provide evidence-based policy making. Thank you.